Hey folks, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at how to render out this really awesome prism scene inside of Blender. This is basically a response to my more recent video called King Acoustics. You can check that out. The link is going to be in the video description and the card in the top right should be right there right now. And if you want to download this scene, you can go over to the Gumroad. I'll have the link down below as well. And you can get this LuxCore prism scene right here. You can download it. This one is free. You can check out some other stuff I have on the Gumroad, but this particular scene is free. If you want to throw me some, some dollars, please do so. And as always, if you want to become a patron, I also have that link down below as well. You get some really awesome stuff with that. Throw me a like if you can, subscribe to the channel, all that cool stuff. Let's go ahead and get started inside of Blender. So here we are right here, and I have a couple things open, and I'm just going to show you a couple things about this particular scene. Let's turn off the lock camera to view. And I'm just going to show you what this looks like just as it currently is. It, I might have a couple different settings on here from the download version, but you'll be able to check all that stuff out once you get that file and you can kind of follow along with me. So right now, basically what we have is a denoised viewport with some really cool uh, caustic effects and some really nice prism effects going on with these objects. And they're basically just beveled. Let me just turn this over here onto solid mode and we can zoom in uh, over here. They're basically just beveled uh, three-dimensional triangles here. So you can see that right there. That's how that is done. It's pretty simple. And the material is very simple as well. It's a basic glass material with a dispersion effect, okay? And some of these I have set to have a little bit of a different transmission color and stuff like that. So, uh, and also I think I set some different IORs or something maybe on some of them, but that doesn't really matter. What, what matters here is knowing that when you're going to be rendering out these really awesome prism caustics like what you see in that render, you need to make sure that you have the dispersion on right here, okay? The other thing is that when LuxCore is first opened up, and again, if you don't know how to use this engine, you need to check out a bunch of my videos. I'll have some of them listed in the video description down below. But basically, uh, what you need to do is you need to make sure that this little checkbox is checked on for light tracing, because that is going to be what shows you the really, really cool prism effects. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to turn it off and show you what it looks like without light tracing, OK? So you can see here we have a scene that looks pretty normal as what you would expect to see out of cycles or something like that. So you don't really see those cool caustics effects. You see some little points of light around. There was the denoise right there for the viewport. And um, it, it looks just like a regular scene except for it has these really cool uh, like this dispersion effect going on with the prisms that we have here. But you don't really see any sort of um, really cool effects. And that is where the light tracing comes in, OK? And when you turn this on, where the light rays are right here, you can set this to a lesser value, like 20% or something like that. And it will run the render um, a little bit quicker. But what you need to kind of keep in mind is that when you're doing these renders, sometimes you need to check a frame or two and just uh, you know compare one to the other, You know, set it to 20%, set it to 100 and just see what it looks like. Some of this is CPU bound. So if you have a lower end, not not lower end, but like a less powerful CPU, you might not get the light rays rendered as quickly. So just keep that in mind when you're setting this stuff on. If you find that it takes a long time to render it out over here, just set this down a little bit, see if that helps, okay? So the next thing here is that clamping, basically what clamping is, is it takes the values from zero to one ratio and it basically says anything beyond this value, it's going to set that to the max value, okay? So the max brightness right here is at a one. And that might be for some kind of final after a bunch of compositing and stuff like that when you're gonna deliver this to somebody. But generally speaking, you wanna set this to something like a 10 or something like that because a 10 will kind of mimic what people are used to in cycles. Even though cycles now has the clamping, I think turned off as a default, it used to be set to 10 a lot. So the brightness allows you to have things beyond the one value. And you can see right here, this super, super bright color right in here, that white, that's much brighter than it was before. And to understand what clamping does, you kind of have to play with it a little bit. But what's very cool with LuxCore is that when you do a render, it will actually give you a suggested value to set your clamp at so that you get less fireflies and less weird effects and stuff like that. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not as good. So just, 
you know, you can try it out and see how it does, but you can see here it's less than a one, so that's going to be a pretty dull uh, render, and it's not going to give you much to play with as far as like glare and adding some glow effects and stuff like that. So just keep that in mind. The other thing, if we go down the list here, when we go to sampling. Now, when you're doing your final renders, this is very important. You can do progressive, and that will basically run the full frame, and it will do like one sample for each pixel, and it will kind of like spit it out, and you can kind of see how it goes, and see, you can hit the escape button, and see what number of passes will work for you. But when you're doing your final, what you really want to use is this cache-friendly version, because the cache-friendly one is a faster rendering pattern that it will do for your entire render. If you're doing an animation or something like that, you really want to set this for your final, because that will be the fastest, okay? So then we get into adaptive, which a lot of people know about. Adaptive sampling basically means that it's going to read the amount of noise that's between pixels and based on the values that you put in here, it will decide when that particular section is done rendering and it will move your devices to work on another section of the frame that will it has more noise in it. So it will just focus on those instead of the ones that you don't need. So very important for increasing your speed in your rendering, no matter what rendering software you're using, whether it's Cycles or Pro Render or anything like that, you always want to use adaptive sampling because it's a really good way to save time. So the next thing is pixel filtering, which basically will filter out certain things based on the size that you put in there. But since we're using a denoiser, we really don't need to worry about the pixel filtering because our denoiser is going to work on that for us, okay? So let's actually, if you are using an animated thing, if you're doing an animated sequence, what you want to do is make sure that you set this seed to this right here, which means that over time, the noise pattern is going to change. You never want to see like a stationary noise throughout the entire thing because it's visible. So you want to make sure that you hit that if you're doing a uh, animation. But we're going to turn that off. Don't use tiled unless you really, really need to. And usually you'd only need to use that if you're running out of space on your video card. So right here where it says uh, denoiser, you want to check that on. And although you can use this other one, use OIDN. From what I understand, open image uh, denoiser is supposed to be the best version. Someone's probably going to tell me in the comments that I'm wrong. For this right here, the max memory right here, it basically allows you to do your denoising and you can allow a certain amount of megabytes or gigabytes to be specifically for that particular thing. So I set it to 24. You probably want to, I think it is set to six gigabytes uh, for that. And either one, you, you know, just check this out, see what works for you, that kind of thing. But, you know, play with this a little bit. And what really is the most important thing for a lot of people when doing this is that if you don't have any halt conditions on, you got to remember that this engine was, I believe, this is what I've been told by everybody, was originally made for people who are doing things like architectural renders or something that needs to be extremely photorealistic. And so a lot of times people would want to just run it and run it and run it until it looked good. So they would just have it run, 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 run for however long it needs to be. Five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, it doesn't matter, right? So what they did is they added this right here for people who want to do animations. And these halt conditions allow you to do animated or just to set particular parameters on how long everything's going to render, just like you would with cycles or something like that. But there's a couple more things that you can actually do here. So you can see here that there's a use time, which basically for me, if I think of it in minutes, I'll say, okay, I want something to render for two minutes. So 60 seconds, because it's time in seconds, times two for two minutes, hit enter, and now you have 120 seconds, and it actually tells you two minutes down here. So that's pretty cool. You can also use samples, okay? So it says here it should be multiple of 32, which makes sense because of just you know how math works with programming and how the samples are done inside of this program or this render engine rather. So what you wanna do is basically go, okay, 32 times, I don't know, 500 or something like that, okay? That's a lot. <laughs> so uh, you know, 16,000 samples if you have to do that or something like that, or 32 times 10, um, 320 samples, okay? So that needs to be dependent on when you like are doing your render checks to see about your animation, you should pick like a frame, you know, in the beginning, the middle and the end and see how many samples actually works. And you probably want to use the highest number for that. And then check that on, set the number of samples and run that animation. Okay. And then there's use light path samples and use noise threshold, which noise threshold will give you the most consistent. So again, you'll need to 
do some checks. You'll need to, you know, set the noise threshold to certain values, see what works, see what doesn't work, and use that throughout your entire animation. And that will keep a consistent noise amount so that when you do your denoising or you are doing your compositing or anything like that, the noise is going to look the same. You're not going to have one frame that has a whole bunch of noise and another frame that doesn't. Okay, so that's a good way to do it as well. Now, when you're checking out the rendering for your viewport, what you really need to do is really a couple things when you are setting this thing up. So if we go to edit our preferences and we take a look at the Lux Core add-on right here, and you go down the list, you can see here that there's a way to select your API for your GPU. OpenCL is more for things like probably the Intel graphics cards or an internal graphics card that uh, is integrated into your CPU system. And then for your discrete ones, it would be, uh, you would use OpenCL for something like an AMD card, and then CUDA for something that is a NVIDIA card like this one right here, and you can see it right there. Then you want to change your viewport render to use your GPU. Now what's important is that when you are using the light tracing, that uses your CPU independently. And for everything else that's rendered behind it, that's when the GPU kicks in. So if we go over here and we look at this in the rendered view, you can see that there's a couple different things. There's all the little light speckles coming off of the, uh, the prisms here, but then you saw there was like a lot more like quick rendered stuff in the background going on, that was the GPU rendering a certain layer. So think of it like the GPU is rendering the more lightweight stuff for the scene. And then the light tracing is being handled all of this stuff here, all this really cool light that's being casted, that's being taken care of by the CPU light tracing render, okay? So just keep that in mind when you're doing this. And you can use the light tracing in your final render by selecting it at the top and changing it down here. You can do that for your viewport as well as changing your denoiser and stuff like that. So if you wanted to use the optics denoiser over the OIDN, you could choose that there as well. And you wanna make sure that you set your device here appropriately. And for the halt time, this basically works the same way as we already talked about with the halt conditions, except for it's in your viewport. We can set this to you know 30 seconds instead, and it's gonna run it over here. If I turn on the overlay, you can see at the top right here it says, raise per sample and um, you can see right here there's time in seconds. So it's gonna run until that time that we set there is up. What's really important about LuxCore is also your lighting when you wanna get that really cool light tracing stuff going on, okay? So I'm going to turn off all of my lights here in the scene and we're just gonna look at what it's like with the environment lighting, okay? And I cover a lot of this stuff in the tutorials on my channel. so. If you want to know how to do a lot of this specific stuff, I do show you how to do it. So this is what it looks like with just our HDRI environment lighting. Okay, so pretty flat, not really a whole lot going on, okay? And if we add, let's add in this light right here. And let's just take a look at this. So it's a point light, and you can see here it's a 0.1 M, 0.1 meter radius. And if we look at this in the rendered view, again, not really much going on. So I, I don't remember why I had that up there, but it's there, so we can just leave it there. And we'll turn that one off. And let's just take a look at this square light that I have right here. And we'll look at that in the rendered view. And you can see that one right there because of how it's angled and the size of it, which is very important, that the size is scaled down like this big. That's what's causing the lines to kind of shoot off like this. And if I were to scale this up to be about that size, and let's just take a look at it, what it is like in the rendered scene, you can see that it's a lot brighter, but you can see that the uh, those dis really cool dispersion fragmented color that was like shooting off the sides, it's not as obvious, it's not as clear, it's more diffused. So if we scale this back down, I'm just gonna hit Control Z there and take a look at this again, you can see that when it's a smaller light, it's more intense and it's shooting more directly at those objects, which is allowing the dispersion effect to actually make that really cool effect that you see there, okay? So the prism is being created by the size of the light and the intensity. And what we can actually do, if you look over here on the right, you can see this little checkbox that says laser. And I'm just gonna turn this to solid, check that on and then turn this back onto the rendered view. 
And you can see there that it's even more intense because it's basically like a really, really tiny, intense light that's shooting right at that object. So if you really wanted to have a lot of these really, really neat effects like this, you want that laser checked on and you want to experiment with moving that around your scene. And the same thing with these uh, cone-shaped lights that I have here. If we take a look at them, you can see that the size of the spot shape is really small and stuff like that. But there's nowhere for, basically, if we turn this to a point light, you see the radius right there? If we go back to the spotlight, you see the radius is gone, right? So the thing is that the way that these spotlights work, they're like super tiny, intense lights. And when you're trying to make, like, I do have a whole um, course on creating a scene in, uh, for underwater scenes and stuff like that using LuxCore. You want to use this type of light because it works the best. And if we take a look at how this is rendered here, you can see that once those are on, it just goes crazy. Like there's all this intense light going on, okay? And let's actually turn the laser off on this one because we don't really need that. And turn this back on. And that's going to be the scene that we have there. So we have the light that's not a laser anymore. It's got more of a uh, surface area right here. And it's shooting that light right through there. So your lighting is super important with uh, creating the dispersion and the prism effect here. And the way, the orientation, where you've placed those lights also is going to determine what that looks like. So you really need to experiment with where you place those and how you angle them and all that kind of fun stuff. So let's say that we're ready to go as far as our final render here. So we want to set a halt condition. I set this to five minutes, so that's 300 seconds. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to turn on a noise threshold. So basically, it'll if it meets two conditions, so either if it gets to five minutes, it'll stop, or if it meets this noise threshold, it will stop. And what we're going to do is we're going to set that, and we're going to keep the light paths to this right here. I think for the final that I showed in the Gumroad file, these are all set to 32, but this is fine. We'll just leave it to that. And we are going to render this out and take a look at what it looks like when it is denoised and everything. And let's go ahead and hit F12. And there's the render window up here. And you can see as it starts, you could see how there was that background basically got filled in. And where the CPU is rendering all these like little light rays and everything, that's all that kind of like more peppered look in the background, okay? But basically the GPU is running through with that cache system, the cache friendly. It basically runs it through like this and it keeps going over and over and over from bottom to top and it keeps rendering those areas out as quickly as it can. And it's also scanning. You can see right up here, those pixels converged. That is the noise threshold. So basically 68% of our scene is done and there's the rest to go. And you can also see the number of samples. You can see the time that's remaining and all of that cool stuff right up here. So let's go ahead and let this render and take a look at it once it's done. Alrighty, so there we go. It's now denoising as you can see right there. We're not gonna see it really quick because the denoising actually shows up if we go into the compositor here. You can see that we have the regular image. Let's just make it so that back here, let's fit it in. And if we pull this over like this here, you can see that it doesn't look like it's denoised yet. But if we make sure that the viewer here is looking through the denoised, so you can see here I have the viewer node. We're looking through denoised now. And if we pull in the render results, go to the viewer node setting here, you can see that now it's denoised. So you can see there it's you know, not as uh, sharp looking as if we look at the render result. You can see how much sharper that is, but it is noisy. And if we look through the viewer node, you can see that it's all cleaned up now. So. So that's going to be it for this tutorial. Hopefully you learned how to set all of your render settings inside of LuxCore for what you need. Obviously, this is a very quick overview of everything, but I think if you play with some of this stuff, you'll really get a handle of it. It's not that hard to learn. Thank you so much for watching. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. And thank you so much to all of my patrons. You guys are all awesome. And if you could, write down below what your experience has been so far with LuxCore. I'm very interested to see what you think in the comments down below. So please let me know. And I will see you all next time on DJ Tutorials.